نصلى على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Rum he speaks about many of his signs and he says and of his signs is the sign or the miracle of him creating a spouse or a partner for you so that you may be tranquil unto them and he has created between you love and mercy and verily within this are signs for people that think and contemplate an attempt to com comprehend. On this evening, before we begin with the main topic, there was a lot of questions that were asked about cryptocurrency. And I, I hope to give some, shed some sort of light on cryptocurrency, um, basically only from a jurisprudential level. Obviously, I wouldn't take um, market advice of myself even. <laughs> regardless of itself about the stock market or the cryptocurrency market, or understanding of the cryptocurrency market for that matter. Uh, and so from the perspective of the majority of the marajah, uh, it is permissible and allowable to trade in cryptocurrency. It is permissible to buy and to sell cryptocurrency. Although you will see on the internet, there are some people that will bring some fatawa that say this is a fatwa from Sid Sistani and, and it's not from the actual site or from Sid Ali Khamenei saying that it is not permissible or it's dubious or something along those lines. Um, it took a bit of research to get the actual answer from the office of uh, Sid Sistani and the office of the Maraja to say that no, on the contrary, it's like buying or selling any other commodity. The only difference being is that if you are going to trade in anything, let's say, for example, you want to put money in stock. If you want to buy shares in something, you have to make sure that the company you're buying shares in doesn't deal uh, or doesn't profit uh, or trade in illicit means. So, for example, I can't buy stock in a company that, uh, that's core purpose of trade or trades in, let's say, alcohol. It's, it's a company that makes wine or sells wine or B, for example, or a company that makes illicit material of some sort, or a company that does anything that is haram, that I can't buy stocks in that. But I can buy stocks in companies that do things that are um, majorly halal. I don't want to speculate on which companies do what. That's up to the people to research this. And this is the same thing with cryptocurrency. With cryptocurrency, ultimately, there are so many currencies. I think Last year, there were up to 2,300 different currencies. I don't know how many currencies there is today. There are so many different ones. And these currencies, ultimately, although one of the questions that was sent in is because a lot of the currencies were used for, for illicit means. People would buy illegal things on them. If anyone's heard of the website, the Silk Road, on the dark web, anybody? Yeah? So the Silk Road back then, before they shut it down and before they, they, uh, they caught the guy, funny... I don't know why it's funny. I hope I didn't say anything that's a, that means something to the younger generation. <laughs> Forgive me if I have. But there was a website on the dark web called the Silk Road, and they've named it obviously after the, uh, the global tra trade route, which was also known as the Silk Road many uh, hundreds of years ago. And it was something where people could buy illegal things, and they could order hits, for example, get someone assassinated or I don't know what other sort of things or buy drugs online or whatever they used to do. And the guy that was running it got caught or at least somebody that was blamed for it and he was jailed for life, actually. He, they jailed him for life. And uh, they shut down the Silk Road and they were using cryptocurrency to buy this. So whatever they use that money for is not basically our business. Ultimately, we're investing in a currency like any other currency. 
be it um, uh, f foreign exchange, like uh, US dollar, or um, the euro, or whatever other currencies, the lira, the peso, whatever currencies are out there, this is basically what it is that we're trading in. So inshallah, this is a, uh, a short, but uh, a, a concise, but uh, enlightening answer regarding the question of if we can trade with cryptocurrency or not. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And so we can move on to the main topic of tonight, which is basically the anatomy of marriage. And when we look at this concept of marriage, it's something that's very important for us to gain some understanding of it. And it's important for us to look at this concept of marriage in the correct light. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of it in the Holy Quran as one of his signs. But the first step I want to take is to have a look at what are the logical reasons for marriage. When, when it's looked at from a secular perspective and from a material perspective, what do they say about marriage? What do the non-Muslims say about marriage? What does the research say about marriage? And this is something that's very important for us to understand before we get to what the religion says about marriage. This helps us understand what is this whole purpose? Why should I even speak about it? Why do we have to get married? Now some people, they have the idea that the whole point of marriage is sexual gratification. That this is what ma marriage is all about. You know? And as the famous saying, there, there is more to marriage than four bare legs in a bed. And clearly it is much more than this. And in the modern era we have learned this. Why? In the modern era that we are living in, there are so many different ways to attain this gratification. And it's probably never been easier on earth than it has been today. With the advent of the internet and the use of the internet and all of the platforms that we use on the internet for this, it's never become easier. So what is the purpose of getting married or going towards this route from a material perspective? Some more things against marriage. In Australia, there's a 45% divorce rate. Globally, it's around 50%. That When people get married, half of those people that get married are going to get divorced based on the statistics, that they don't stay married, they don't complete it. So again, people look at this and they say, and, and I've heard people make funny jokes about it, they say if, if you're going skydiving and they told you there's a 50% chance the parachute won't open, then you obviously wouldn't go skydiving, would you? So why would you get married? And obviously this is clearly qiyas, conjecture, that you're talking about, two completely different things. Marriage is far more painful than a parachute not opening when you skydive. No. <laughs> no. Just lightening the mood. But what, what it is, when we look at this, it's conjecture because it's completely two different things. And so there's a psychiatric stress index uh, called the Raal Holmes Stress Index. And it's a survey that um, the American Psych Psychiatry Association has made up to sort of see how stressed a person's life is. This is important, just to give us an idea of the importance of marriage in a person's life. Why does somebody need it? Even if we look away from the religious reasons. And inshallah, we'll talk about some studies and some research. So within this stress index, basically it's a survey where you have a look and the, the thing that's number one on the stress index, there's 50 items and you look at the 50 items and you choose which that have happened to you in the last year and you get points for each one. Number one is 100 points, number 50 is 11 points. And it sort of goes down in, in, in increments, right? And you choose the one that gives you the most stress, and that gives the psychiatrist an idea of how stressed you are in life. Number one on the stress index is the death of a spouse. That's 100 stress points. That's the most stressful thing, according to uh, psychiatry associations, that can happen to you. The death of a spouse. Number two is a divorce, believe it or not. Number four is being incarcerated in an institution, and you're being jailed or locked up. Number seven is marriage itself. So if we have a look at these statistics, obviously it's telling you they're very stressful, but when it tells you the most stressful one is the death of a spouse, not the death of a parent, not the death of a child, not the death of a, of a, of a close relative, but the death of a spouse is number one on this index. Why? And they look at it completely from a material perspective. 
Because ultimately that life partner that you have, you are going to live with that person more than you live with anyone on earth. You are going to be more intimate in every way possible than anyone else on earth. If you've been married to your spouse for 20 or 30 years, then it's most likely you have lived with her more than she has lived with her own parents and her own family. And she knows you more than, than, than uh, she knows your own parents or your own family. Statistically, people who get married live longer. Statistically, people who get married are more financially stable. And anyone that's a boss knows this. When they go to employ someone, you employ a married person, you know you're going to get a bit of reliability. You employ a single person, after he gets his first pay, you don't see him for a while. Is that all right? Or, yep, I can see the boss is smiling. <laughs> and so, so if you have your own company or something, this is something that you look at because you know that there's reliability there, so they're going to be more financially stable, definitely. They're going to be happier in their life. Not only that, they're going to feel like they have some sort of meaning within their life when they get married. And this is, again, these are all secular studies. More than that, from a legal perspective, you have so, much, so many more advantages by being married. From, uh, for example, for tax purposes. Would you agree, inshallah? If there's anyone that will agree with me in this uh, room. Um, income purposes. And so marriage, in that sense, makes so much sense from a secular perspective. And then, <laughs> and then when we look at it, from a primal perspective, just instinctual, part of instinct. That as a human being, let's say you have no religion. But every human being gets to a point where they feel like that one day I am mortal and I have to leave this earth. What do I leave behind? You think about legacy. People do think about legacy. That They think about what is it that I'm going to leave behind. Maybe when you're young, you still haven't got that idea yet. But as you get older, you do begin to think about things like that, that what will I leave behind, even from a non-religious perspective. And this is where marriage helps for you to create some sort of meaning and have perhaps have a child or two, and these children will be some sort of legacy that you leave behind. It's sad when you hear about a person, for example, that's, let's say, the last remaining member of their family. They have no nephews and no nieces, and they never got married, and they're never going to have children. So when they die, that... Uh, flank of their family name is gone forever it's eliminated imagine how you feel do you know in fact in many studies they, they, re they uh, surveyed homeless people and do you know what the homeless people said the worst part of being homeless was does anyone want to take a guess not no money, not no shelter being ignored people walk past them and they don't even look at them twice they're just ignored every time it's as if they're not even there. Think about that for a second. You're in the city, you walk past, some homeless guy sitting there doing his thing. He's high or he's drunk or maybe he's just sitting and doing nothing. And we just completely ignore them like they're not there. That is like the worst part of being homeless. So when you refuse to take that step forward, that's what's going to happen. You're going to go into the night, quietly into the night, like a blip. And there's going to be no legacy. And this is why from a secular perspective, they look at it and say, you know what? This is important. So the concept of gratification is completely not, it's not even there. And that's why it's important. This is one of the reasons that we really do need to think about it from this perspective. And to have a look at it and get some sort of understanding of it, of the importance of us working towards trying to get married. Particularly for the youth particularly for the youth that are unmarried. This is something that's important that, we, that they look at it from a secular perspective and say, well, hold on a minute. Even from a secular, non-Islamic perspective, it makes sense. This isn't just about what Islam commands. It's not just about what Islam tells us what to do in that sense. And the next part, inshallah, we will speak about what Islam says about marriage and the importance of marriage. And again, this is... Very important. Why? This is the faith that we follow. This is the path that we have. This is the beacon of guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to put some stability into our lives. To give us a path to go towards the goals that we are supposed to reach within our lives. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala dhikrihi sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad.
So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi, he says, ma bunya fil Islam, binaun ahabba ila Allah azza wa jal, wa a'az min al-tazweej. He says that there is no institution or establishment that was more beloved or honored by Allah than marriage. This is the most important institution in Islam. Why is it labeled an institution? Because that's exactly what marriage is. Marriage is an institution. Marriage is an establishment. What you were doing, it's not just about bringing two people together. And in fact, it's almost everything about life. If you see within the narrations that uh, the Imams and the Holy Prophet speak about marriage being the key to happiness. In fact, in the famed dua from the Quran, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adab nar. Our Lord, grant us in this world goodness. And in the hereafter, goodness and save us from the fire of hell. In one tradition it says, goodness in this world is having a good wife in this world. Fid dunya hasana is having a good wife in this world. Wa fil akhirati hasana is al-hur al-ayn insha'Allah. Wa qina adab al-nar, adab al-nar is compared, the, and, and save us from the fire of hell, is to having a difficult spouse in this dunya. To have a difficult wife in this dunya is like hellfire. This is what the comparison is. And it's true. Remember yesterday when we spoke about the, the demise of Sayyidina Khadija Sallallahu Alaihi we said behind every great man is an even greater woman. That ultimately this infers to, it makes inferences towards the establishment and the institution of marriage as the Holy Prophet was speaking about. So when we look at it as an establishment and an institution, we need to pause for a second and think about, hold on. So what do I need to think about? When it, bec when, when it comes to marriage. What is the anatomy of this institution that I am building? Why? This institution, this infrastructure, isn't something that's physical and tangible. I am building something that's intangible, but it's greater than any building or structure that I can build. And so I need to look at what is the anatomy of this structure. In other words, what's the makeup of this structure? And it begins, number one, with who do I want to marry? Who do I want to spend the rest of my life with? And you see, even within the secular studies, you see that never do they mention money as something or, or a main factor if marriages continue or they don't. They do have some different weird statistics, but money is not one of them. Of the weird statistics that they have, apparently there was a study that if you look at childhood photos, and if a person is smiling in their childhood photo, then it's very likely that their marriage will be a happy marriage. Apparently there's a correlation. The study that was made. I'll leave that up to the scientists to see what the, the, the meaning behind this. And many other small different correlations that they have depending if some, uh, to, to sort of decide if someone's going to have a happy marriage. But never is money one of those factors and never is good looks one of those factors. And the interesting thing about, it, about beauty is beauty, as the, the saying says, is in the eye of the beholder, right? So beauty is different to everyone else. And if, and if you notice, subhanAllah, from a scientific perspective, there is no empirical measurement or quantity for beauty. We don't have a measurement. You know, I saw a girl and she was 5.6 beauties. It doesn't exist. You know, you can't, uh, it, it doesn't work that way, does it? There is no measurement for it. That beauty is based on what the person sees. So again, this isn't something that... Uh, we have the ability to quantify what it is But what we do see And what we can quantify Are good manners What we can quantify A good and happy person A supportive person And in the hadith The Holy Prophet Sallallahu alayhi Wa alihi wa sallam He emphasizes this He emphasizes that the most important point Is taqwa And if you look for a spouse Based on her piety and her taqwa You will have a good and happy life even when we hear about, for example, they tell us, say the Khadija was of the most beautiful women. But obviously, other than Rasulullah and the people that were surrounding her, the women, they're the ones that saw her. Or Fatima al Zahra, salawatullahi alayha. Or Sayyidah Zainab, salamullahi alayha. We don't even know what they looked like. But we hear that Amir al Mu'mineen says, no matter how stressful my day got, when I would come home and look into the face of Fatima, all that stress would be alleviated. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Why? It's because of the taqwa of Fatima. The relationship here, 
And this is where I want to move on because first we, we look at it. What I want to I want to have a look at it from a secular perspective. So from a secular perspective, they're telling us that money and looks, they don't add up to anything. But there's little small things that do. I'll tell you another interesting study. They say that people that watch romantic comedies have much less satisfaction in their marriage. There was a study on this actually. There's much less satisfaction. So they watch a romantic comedy and they're like, oh, my marriage isn't that fun. <laughs> my wife isn't that fun. My husband won't just come to me at work and sing a song with a guitar or something as what would happen in a romantic comedy. Gee, you know, I need to really <laughs> recalculate what's happening here. You know, why will not my husband make a fool of himself for me? <laughs> Unacceptable. And so this is an actual study that people that watch romantic comedies are less satisfied with uh, what their marriage is about. But we see from an Islamic perspective, when you get married and you live a God-centric life, so to speak, where you live a life where what is important is what does my creator want from me? Because my creator wants what is best for me. When I have this, this is what I get. It doesn't matter if the person is what, what is commonly known as physically attractive. And unfortunately, this is what it's become. And the funniest part about it is basically anyone with their, with their profile on social media doesn't even need to put their real photo, just a photo that looks sort of like them. Or if you look like sort of like a celebrity, put that celebrity's photo up. Isn't that what happens? And then eventually when you meet up, you know, that person might be very embarrassed to just walk the other way. But ultimately we create whatever image we think it's going to be. But in the real world, your image isn't going to be that way. Your real world, in the real world, your image isn't really going to matter. It's going to come down to your akhlaq, it's going to, to your mannerisms, it's going to come down to your piety, to the taqwa that you have. And so when you go for spouse selection, when you look for someone and say, look, I want to get married, but I'm going to make an informed decision. Because I'm doing something that's going to be for the rest of my life. I'm going to, to embark and build an establishment. You wouldn't just go into business with someone randomly because they had a nice smile. You wouldn't go into business randomly with somebody because they claim to have certain credentials. And how many a person has been ripped off trying something like that? How many a person has been ripped off believing somebody was, the other day I think they, they deported a guy that claimed to be the prince of Tahiti or the king of the, you know, the heir to the, to the throne of Tahiti and he was making business deals all over the place. They locked him up and they deported him back to uh, New Zealand I think at the time. That's just one of them. You know how many of those there is around that claim to be a prince or a king of some country? A country that doesn't exist sometimes. And they rip people off. Now, when we look at it in terms of marriage, I'm building an institution, I have to look at what criteria is important. And in the institution of marriage, the most important criteria is what? Is taqwa. Because if somebody has piety and they fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and if, they, if it's pure piety, then their akhlaq should be good. Their mannerisms should be good. They should be good people. They should be somebody that I can establish some, something, with, something with and something that is so important. The Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he says that sharrul ashya al mar'atu su the most wicked and vile of things is having an evil spouse, an evil wife. And I know as, as of, uh, up to now I've only spoken about one side, which is the women. But leave that for now, inshallah, I will uh, turn over the, the channel soon and we'll start um, beating on the men a little bit. And so when we look at this concept, we see Islamically that it's important for us to select who it is that we marry and who we take as a spouse. Why? Ultimately, the goal of this marriage and this institution is to create good people on the earth. That's the goal. So when you look at it, this is why when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, he says to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ya Ali, لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ عَلَى يَدَيْكَ أو على يدك عَلَى يَدَيْكَ عَفْوًا رَجُلًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِمَّا طَلَعَتْ عَلَيْهِ الشَّمْسِ He says that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to guide a person by your hands, O Ali, then this is better than everything that the sun touches. Or this is better than everything that the sun sets on. So when we think about this, we think, alright, let's go out and find some non-Muslim and preach to them and turn them to Islam and this is, I would have guided a person and received this reward. Rather, this reward is the same if I create a good person. 
if I raise a person that's going to be a good person, and this is what the purpose is behind the institution of marriage, is that. That's ultimately the goal of it. So when this becomes the goal, we need to have an understanding of what it is that we are entering when we're going towards marriage. So when we look at the concept of what does a male think about and look for when it is marriage and what does a female look about? What does a brother look for and what does a sister look for when they're going towards this thing of marriage? And what do they need to understand before they embark on this? The first thing we know is that for a male, when he goes towards marriage, he looks at marriage as what? This is going to be the end of my virginity. Now I'm going to be able to prove my masculinity. I'm going to be a man. I'm going to have a woman. That's it. All right? So when they start thinking like this, of the thoughts alike, I'm going, I need to get somebody, what, that's attractive. Why? Because people might see her. We're going to see and get the approval of the people around me. Would I go for this girl or would I not go for this girl? I can't judge my judgment. I, I can't use my, I have to use somebody else's judgment. What do you think of this girl? For example, these are the sorts of ideas that go through youth. You know why? As the Holy Prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, shabab shu'batun min al junoon That youth is a part of insanity. And it's true. You do things that they'll never do later. You know, like the things you do now, like the wild haircuts and things like that, and the tattoos and everything. When you go older, you'll have a look at this and you will laugh at yourself. Or you will cringe with shame. Like, what the heck was I thinking when I took this photo? Or what was I thinking when I really want, when I got this tattoo? What was it that I was thinking? Or what was I thinking? Oh, you know, like the guy that got the tattoo of his... Uh, his first girlfriend. And then when he got married, he's like, I better change it. Then he got divorced. So he kept tattooing names over names. And eventually he just did a portrait over all the names because they started getting very messy. Anyway, <laughs> it's another story. The point is that we do these crazy things. You look at them later on and you will cringe. You think, what was I thinking of? What was I doing? So what a man needs to understand when it comes to marriage is that when he is going to get married, the whole purpose of this marriage is that he's building an institution and from this institution he's going to build a family. And so when he thinks of marriage in this way, he needs to understand that he will have privileges for being married. But these privileges come with responsibility. Or should I say, the responsibility is the core, is the core or the foundation of these privileges. By having that responsibility, this is where you attain the privileges. The greater the responsibility, the greater the privilege. When you begin to think about it like that and understand that I'm going to have a partner that I'm going to live with for the rest of my life, all of a sudden, pretty and, and, and silly doesn't sound attractive. Have you ever heard the anecdote between, I don't know if this is true, but it's pretty cool, between Albert Einstein and Marilyn Monroe? Apparently, they, they, they said that one day at a gathering, Albert Einstein met Marilyn Monroe. And Marilyn Monroe in the 1950s was this uh, actress model that was highly attractive at the time. And Albert Einstein, I'm sure everybody knows him, even the, right? We, we know Albert Einstein? No? No, we don't. <laughs> Albert Einstein is a scientist that's very famous. No? Einstein? Yeah? E equals MC squared. It, it, that came up with special relativity and things like that. It makes sense, and, and a lot of uh, theoretical physics. He was the father of a lot of theoretical physics. Anyway, so he's very smart, and the girl's very attractive, and they meet one another, and she says to him, you know what, we should have a child together, because then he will be attractive and intelligent. You know, attractive like me and intelligent like you. And then Einstein said, yes, this is true, but he could also end up ugly like me and dumb like you. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, when you look towards something like this, you need to understand that if I am going to find a spouse, then this is, this is a possibility. That it may end up like this. So I need to find, not that, I need to find someone who has the akhlaq. That's the most important thing. Because ultimately, with everyone that we deal with, eventually, eventually, their appearance is going to change. We're going to grow old. And this is part of a very important statistic. Did you know that we were saying that 50% of marriages end in divorce? 
in the 1950s, the average age for marriage in the Western world, forget about us, in the Western world, we're talking about us, we're talking 12 and 13 years old. In the, in the Western world, it was 21 for women and 23 for men. Now in the Western world, the average age for marriage is 30 for women and 32 for men. And they say the older, this is the advice of um, uh, uh, the American Psychiatric Association, the older you are when you get married, the more likely your marriage will last. That's less likely you will get divorced when you get married when you're older. Do you know why that is? The reason behind this, see, this is something that I, I mentioned, but I'm mentioning carefully why it's contrary to Islamic ideals. Islamic ideals are no, get married young. Get married young, have children young, this is important. These are Islamic ideals. Because you have to be realistic. I'll give you a small example. I'm, let's say, 40 years old today, 41 years old. Okay, My youngest child is eight months old. When that youngest child is 30, I'll be 70. You know what I mean? If I live that long. Do you, do you get the point? So, yeah, it, it's sort of, that's meant to be a sobering point. Inshallah, it is. When you think about it in that way. When you uh, have a look... In the same way, the reason marriages last longer is when they get married, when they're in their 30s and their 40s, all of a sudden they realise, you know what? There's a reliance on one another. We need one another. And we're going to get old and I've got no other options. Because I'm going, I need to grow old with this person, I don't want to be alone. Because it's scary being alone. That I'm going to have to grow old with this person? And this is why I better, I have strong motivation to keep this marriage. Whereas when they get married young, what happens? You get married young, this is I'm talking in the Western world, and perhaps it may affect us, that someone sees you and goes, oh, you're married, but look how young you are. Live your life, you're handsome. And you think, yeah, you know what? I have options. You get excited. Or a girl, same thing, they look at it and say, you're so pretty, I want to ask for your hand for my son. You go, I'm sorry. The girl says, I'm sorry, I'm married. They go, you're married. Straight away in her head, she starts thinking, hmm. I have options. You know, if I don't like what he's saying, I have options. Yeah, it's true. This is probably a lot of the reason why it doesn't last. It comes down to some, something on a, on a primal and instinctual level. That's what it comes down to. I've taken much of your time, but it's, it's a very important topic. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't get into the majority of what I wanted to speak about regarding the anatomy of marriage. So inshallah, I'll just try and... Wrap it up a little bit now uh, as we're getting to the end of the, the time that I have. Sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So with the male, he needs to understand that I'm making a conscious decision. Not this girl is a pretty hot girl or not this girl I accidentally uh, knocked her up. Or something like that. I'm trying to use some different terminology to save uh, the ears of the young ones. That something like that happens. And then you think, oh, well, this is what I'm going to do. Oh, oh my God, she's, she's hot. She's pretty. And everyone thinks she's hot. MashaAllah. So this is what I'm going to go with. This is not a sane and conscious decision. A sane and conscious decision is someone I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. They need to be someone that has akhlaq. They need to be someone that is God-centric. But let me add, for me to attain this, I must be like this too. I can't live a life where I'm just a player. I can't live a life where I've just placed my whole CV of partnership on social media. And then I want to go and ask for a girl's hand in marriage. And I mentioned this before, and I have. But it's important for the young people to think about this because we're living in an era where we really are living in an era where you can't delete anything. Once that content has been created and shared, it's in the ether forever. That's it. It's in the system, whatever it is. Next time you want to send a photo without a shirt, think about that. That it's in the ether forever. You can delete it from your phone, but it's going to come back. Who knows what laws they'll pass. Maybe in 50 years it'll be just standard access in university and school libraries. Ah, let me see what my grandfather's, uh, you know... Photos used to look like. Let me look at my grandfather's uh, just more history. And they'll go through it. And that's it. They'll have an image of you. Think about it. This is what you are creating. It's important for us to think about this in this way. Other than this, in Islamically, we're looking at it that there's a day of judgment. And this month, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, will forgive our shortfalls and our sins. 
But ultimately I'm saying this is what we are creating and it's important for us to look and have an understanding of this. This is for the men. If I'm a good and pious girl, then I have to be a good and pious man. So I have to work on that. I have to look like a dignified person. I have to believe like a dignified person. I have to have piety like a dignified person. And only then can I say that I want a pious woman. Not that yesterday I just finished from the club or only the other day I finished from uh, uh, taking drugs or the other day I fi- and then all of a sudden I'm saying, oh my God, all these women are no good. I want you know, a good and righteous woman. Habibi, this is important for you to look at exactly how you are, to see what you want to attract and then we turn the page and look at the sisters. And again, when it comes to marriage, when we look at what the sisters think marriage is, and unfortunately, a lot of it is influence, is influence that we gain from what is around us. Did you know that if your close friends or family friends have a divorce or are separated, statistically, it's 75% more likely that you will also get a divorce. You know that? And have a look at it. There's a pattern in this. Honestly, there's a pattern. Why? Because everyone wants to show you their lifestyle is the lifestyle that's happening, that's making go, oh, you don't have to put up with this, really? There's life after divorce. That it's not the end of it. Put that aside. When a sister is thinking about marriage, this is what she has to understand. That marriage is not about the things that we see. And this is one of the examples was the study with the romantic comedies. That when we look at marriage and we see that a marriage has so many different things. And again, I'm sure I've mentioned this many a time. How many different parties do we have? Bridal shower, high tea, engagement, any, any that I've missed. Pre-engagement, post-engagement, hen's night. And all a buck's night, Sant, expert on marriage, just gave me some tips. <laughs> and... So these are like multiple parties that they have and each one has to be greater and brighter than the other. Why? Because I have to show it on social media. Everybody has to know about what's going on. This is what I'm doing because this is what marriage is about. Marriage is about me buying this dress and modifying it then telling everyone how I modified it then modifying it again and telling everyone about how I modified it again. About getting a wedding ring and then modifying it and then telling everyone. And And I just have this long saga and story about how I'm such an awesome consumer. And I'm just buying products and selling products and oh wow, this is cool and giving people all sorts of crazy ideas. And then eventually when the marriage happens and the honeymoon finishes and I say, hold on a minute. This is not what this is about. It's no longer Disney princess. All of a sudden it's the start of Cinderella. And so they feel that if this becomes their life, they've walked into a lie, something they don't know they're walking into. The truth is you need to look at it and say, I'm going to marry somebody that I'm going to be with for the rest of my life. I need to know this man has good akhlaq. That's what's important. It doesn't matter how many muscles he has. It doesn't matter how handsome he is. And mind you, the less handsome he is, the more he'll stay with you. The more handsome he is, you're going to have to share him around. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is, this is the reality. And so he needs to be somebody that has good akhlaq. That's what's important. He needs to be somebody that is a good person. That is what is important. And all of these parties mean nothing. And you need to understand that the purpose of marriage is you are going to enter the phase to be in the position of the most valuable human beings on earth. That on this earth you are able to give the greatest commodity and that is human beings. Human beings. A city, even the most elaborate city, with no human beings is worth nothing. But you create one good human being on this earth, as the hadith says, it's better than everything that the sun touches. And that's the whole point. When I go to get married, I need to understand that I need to be educated so I can educate them. I need to be intelligent so I can teach them this intelligence. I need to have good akhlaq so I can discipline these children. You know why? Because anybody can feed children. Anyone can feed children. Machines can feed children. Things come with straws now. You just give it to them and they just feed it through a straw. It doesn't mean anything. Child puts on weight means nothing. What's important is the discipline of the child. What's important is the psyche of the child and the mentality of the child. That is what you're raising. When you enter the marriage, yes, there's a fun part, but this is what I'm really entering. What I'm entering is a union and an institution that's going to create good people. That's what it's really about.
When you think like this, you enter and you don't get disappointed. On the contrary, you enter and you're happy that you are going to make something good. I'll tell you something. You know when you, the, the person, for example, that spends effort on their child, works hard on their child, disciplining their, their child, teaching them the right things. You know when that child comes in, like you see these children that read Quran, some of them, and they read Quran. Do you know how awesome the parents feel? The parents feel like they're bigger than the earth. But you know what? They worked hard for that. They really worked hard for that. You know? And you have a look at them, that's what they did. They disciplined those children. When I say discipline, I'm not even mean they beat them. I mean they sat and spoke to them. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Julus al mar inda ayalihi ahabu ilallah ta'ala min a'tikafin fi masjidi hadha. That sitting with your family, just sitting with your children and talking to them, is more beloved to Allah then you're doing i'tikaf. I'tikaf yani is remaining fasting in a mosque for like three days where you're not allowed to talk about anything other than worship in Masjid Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Who's been to Masjid Rasulullah? How beautiful is Masjid Rasulullah? Just sitting in Masjid Rasulullah. May Allah return those days to us. Wallah. It is, the feeling is unbelievable. It's incomparable. Rasulullah says it is more beloved to Allah. Sit with your children. Just sit with them. Hear what they have to say. Answer a question. Talk to them. Rather than throw him in his room, hold the iPad, free daycare. This is something the sisters and the brothers need to understand, but particularly the sisters. Get married, and then they say, oh, I don't want to have children yet. When do you? I'll, I'll think about it later. Some people can't have children. They can't have children. But if I'm making a conscious decision, why did I get married? Why did I get married? If I'm making a conscious decision to just say, I'm just going to... You know, stand by and see what happens. This is the fruit of life, Allah. And then the fruit of it is, is also being in that position where I'm creating goodly people on this earth and making this earth heavy with the, with the words of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Ali and Waliullah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa Ali Muhammad. But this is just a part of it. Perhaps we may have a continuation tomorrow night. It depends. Sheikh Muhammad is currently ill. And he might not be able to make it tomorrow night. If he doesn't, then I will have a continuation, inshallah, of the, this concept and speak about the paradigm of love, inshallah. If not, inshallah, may Allah cure Sheikh Muhammad and, he, and his will so he can come uh, to the majlis. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on our dead. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us against our lower selves in the same way he helps the righteous of his servants. We ask Allah to hasten the reappearance of our holy Imam, Ajallah Fadr sharif and we ask Allah to make him pleased with us and to make the Imam of our time pleased with us. We ask Allah to have mercy on our dead, to cure our sick, and particularly Sheikh Muhammad and any of the other sick that are, that are out there all over the world, of the believers. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. A'udhu bi jalali kal kareem. أن ينقضي عني شهر رمضان أو يطلع الفجر من ليلتي هذه كقبلي تبعة أو ذنب تعذبني عليه ولا رواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات والشهداء وما الحاضرين رحم الله من قرأ سورة الفاتحة وأهدت ثوابها إليهم مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد